Conference for the Establishment of the International Association for Reconciliation Studies. Glad to see you today again. Um, I have a few announcements. The first was yesterday we were about 100 persons together. This is really, I think, great and I'm very happy about so many people who followed us and who were online or in person with us. The second thing I would like to share is uh, we uh, video recorded the presentations and they have good quality. And so we try to put them also on the website first of the JCIS and then of the association. And there will be an email to you asking you to uh, confirm if you are really okay with publication. This will come today or tomorrow you will receive this email. And the uh, uh, third thing is uh, right today we received a message from a Nobel Prize winner, President Santos from Colombia, who signed the peace agreement. And we expected uh, just a greeting for two minutes, but he sent us a seven minutes speech, which uh, is very interesting. And I think it would be a good thing to start with his uh, speech he sent us and then we start with a normal program uh, with Professor Adwan presenting. So now listen to President Santos' uh, message and speech for us. So we are. Friends, it is an honor to greet you on the occasion of the establishment of the International Association of Reconciliation Studies. And I do it in a very special day. It also happens to be my birthday. I want to share with you a story that gave meaning to my life. The story of how we managed to make possible what many thought impossible. In Colombia, for more than half a century, we suffered an armed conflict between the state and the oldest and strongest guerrillas in the Western Hemisphere, known as the FARC. A brutal conflict that left more than 250,000 dead and more than 8 million victims. <laughs> we had the highest rates of killings, kidnappings, and displaced people in the whole world. For decades, all of my predecessors tried to end this cruel war to no avail. As Minister of Defense and as President, for the last 12 years, I led the actions of our armed forces to deliver the greatest blows these guerrillas had ever received. We took down their number one, their number two, and 37 of their commanders. But I was aware that the solution could not be the extermination of the enemy. True peace, lasting peace, the, the one that tempers our hearts and souls and heals the wounds can only be achieved through dialogue negotiation, and reconciliation. After all, we will all have to live together because we are all sons of the same nation. From being an effective war maker, a hawk, I had to become a pacifier, a dove, a change that is difficult, very difficult to understand. So I was called a traitor. Others in the same situations, like the former Prime Minister of Israel, Isaac Rabin, when he signed the peace with Arafat, paid with their lives. But there is no contradiction here. Sometimes you need to wage war to make peace. I was a hawk because circumstances required it, but 
I always knew, always knew, as I said to the soldiers of our army, that the real victory, the only victory, the ultimate victory is peace. And we made it. After six years of tough negotiations, we signed the peace agreement that ended the last and longest internal, internal armed conflict in the Western Hemisphere. We signed the peace, which is the peacemaking phase. We are now in the peace building phase. Reconciliation is difficult and takes time. There are still problems to be solved. Some would like to undo what has been done, but they won't succeed. Peace with the FARC is irreversible. How is this possible? Through goodwill, perseverance, courage, adequate, adequate planning, yes, but above all, by recognizing each other as human beings. A Harvard professor, Ronald Heifetz, gave me a great piece of advice. He said, whenever you feel discouraged, tired, pessimistic, in this difficult task to achieve peace, talk to the victim. They will give you the encouragement and the strength to keep going, to persevere. And so I did. I initially thought that the victims of the war would be the least supportive of a peace process that would allow their perpetrators to face more benevolent sanctions for the atrocities they committed. I was pleasantly surprised. The people who had suffered most during the war who had lost their loved ones, who had been mutilated by bombs and mines, were the ones who insisted I should persevere in difficult times. Why? Because they didn't want others to endure what they had suffered. What a life lesson they gave me. Their generosity was greater than their pain. I met many women, men, and children who told me their stories and gave me the strength to continue. And most importantly, they helped me better understand that empathy, empathy is the main virtue of any leader. And uh, this is my last and main message to you. Empathy is the ability to put yourself in the shoes of others, to understand their concerns, feel their pain, their conflicts, their contradictions, their fears, their aspirations, their anger. When the pain of others becomes your pain, when the need of others becomes your need, you are not only becoming a better leader, you are also helping yourself. And when you understand that all human beings are one, and that what happens to one happens to all, you will become a better citizen of this world. What separates us today from one another is part of a big illusion. Nations, race, and religion are all human-made concepts. But if we look deep in our hearts, in our origins, we will understand that in the end, once we tear the imaginary labels that set us apart, we are all equal. I wish you every success in your endeavor to promote reconciliation reconciliation worldwide. Thank you. So, yeah, I hope the sound quality was uh, so that you could hear it. Uh, anyhow, we will put the message also on the website and on our um, um, website of the association when it's ready. Now I would uh, like, as we are complete, for those who are new, uh, present to you uh, 
the two other persons who prepared the, this meeting and the association building, Karina Kovastelina and uh, Toyomi Asano. Maybe you just switch on the microphone and say hello, Karina. Uh, good morning, everyone from Washington, D.C. And um, really happy to see everyone again today. It's wonderful to have all these great friends and participants here. Great, thank you. And Toyomi from Tokyo. Hi, good night, good night everybody from Tokyo. It's 30 p.m. I'm very glad to have all of them. And I guess reconciliation study should be developed into a new studies, including not only developing country, but also well developed countries, represented by Black Lives Matter movement, or the Scotland and England, England relations, or Japan, Japan Korean relations. So, uh, as Santos said, reconciliation is a worldwide program. I'm very looking forward to discussing this issue with everybody. Thank you so much. Great, thank you. And the third person I wanted to present, for those who do not know him yet, uh, Dr. Ferrari, who is uh, also organizing the discussion today and who is the coordinator of the Jena Center for Reconciliation Studies. So he will now take the word and we start with the first presentation. Thank you very much, Martin, and thank you very much to all our guests. Today we have also a very exciting program with uh, seven talks, so I think everybody is looking to start. So I am very happy to give a word to Professor Sami Advan from Palestine, Professor for Education and Peace Studies, and his contribute historical narratives and reconciliation, the role of school books in the context of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. I know that Professor Advan has a, a PowerPoint presentation today, I will run the presentation from my laptop and we can coordinate each other to develop the presentation. So now I share the screen with you. So here we are. I think now you can see the presentation. Okay, we can start. Good afternoon, and uh, I would like first to extend my deepest thanks and appreciation to Professor Martin, who invited me to be part of this important gathering and conference in the occasion of the initiation of the uh, Center or International Association for Reconciliation. Thank you, Martin, very much. And also my appreciation and thanks and admiration for also those who initiated this idea of establishing the reconciliation study Professor Karina Asano and also Martin, with always also thank Francesco for putting this together and try to manage this, uh, you know, properly. My talk is will be focused on education, of course, education and the role of education in, in really building up toward reconciliations, I think, and uh, why it's education is very important and study of education practices. Uh, content, teacher training is important, I think, because most of us went or spent at least 16 years of schools. That's one thing. So all children of the whole world mostly attend the schools for 16 years. That's in things very important. And the other thing is also um, education is still uh, a challenge uh, for all of us who think that uh, the role of education should be moved from perpetuating the conflict or, you know, or creating uh, animosity or creating fears to be part, how to move it to be part of reconciliation and peace building. And when I refer to education here in my speak, uh, hopefully, uh, when I refer to the Palestinian Israeli context and my work with the PRIME, the Peace Research Institute in the Middle East, which I spent the last 25 years trying to work how to move education from continuation uh, supporting for conflict toward a, a peaceful coexistence, which is part of it reconciliation, part of it understanding, part of it recognition, etc. So, um, so that's, uh, that's my preamble of my presentation. 
Uh, I mean, education is a complex also. Uh, it's not an easy to deal with, com with uh, uh, education. It's very complex. There's ma so many stakeholders from government to, p to parents, to community, to NGOs, etc. So, but it, at the same time, uh, it's worth spending so much studying how uh, education could be part of uh, reconciliation processes. Could you move to the second one, please? Um, Yes, uh, as you know, uh, Palestinian and Israeli are engaging in a long, long term, almost over a century of conflict, which has been described as protracted and intractable. And meaning that the conflict is been so long and entered into all aspects of life, from culture to tradition, to social psychology, to identity, to national building, to, uh, to even food, everything. So part of the, this, uh, the, 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 the the issue of uh, you know uh, this long-lasting conflict, which is everybody hopes to um, end sooner than later, so that's why schooling and controlling of uh, history is a mechanism that is used by engaging in conflict to control education and what goes into the next generation and how to prepare the next generation in the line of their political agenda. And I think yesterday one of the colleagues mentioned how to reach out to the future and to reach out also to the next generation. I would say through education and why it's being controlled because I think so many political interests are trying to isolate people from taking or preparing for their own futures. Um, when, why we talk about history? History is not the past, as Karina was mentioned also yesterday. History, yes, is part of the past, but we are the product of history as we are now. And also, at the same time, we are seeing this history in the light of our future perspectives. So it's not that. That's why we moved, you know, history from the past to the present and to the future. How we see the future is part of how our historical narrative that we carry with us is throughout. There's so many assumptions that forbid uh, teaching history from being uh, history from being powerful means for uh, reaching out to recognition, to humanization, to uh, to uh, to respect others in different ways. That's why we, we are trapped in these historical assumptions that there's one history. In, in, in reality, there's many histories. We should move one history to, to histories plural. Also, no, there's no object in, objective in history. There's no objective history. History is being written regardless who wrote it, historian, scientist, uh, a researcher is written also from the, uh, I mean, psychological, subjective understanding of those who write it. Other things, there's no end to history. History is unfolding discipline. We will continue working with, with history you know, forever without reaching an end. The problem is with history, we only select part of that history that serve our interests. And we forbid our children or our generation from reaching out to that part of histories. That's why in conflict time, uh, society developed what's called being master historical narrative, which is really being adopted by official by and try to indoctrinate or inoculate this uh, master historical narrative to the next generation. But most important issue when we talk about history is what is the missing absence or avoiding or neglecting part? If you look at any, any historical text, you can find so many missing things. Why it's been, it was done, of course, in purpose, and some naive people said it could be done naively, but there's nothing naive unto that things. Uh, history also in conflict time, as it is in the Palestinian Israeli context, as Pierre said, maybe also the issue of you know, teaching history, maybe Japan, uh, South Korea, China, Japan, even Turkey, uh, Armenia, even if you look at uh, also North and South, uh, and South Cypriot, you find only focus in wars, conflicts, and winning, losing, etc. There's no other focus on the other part of history which really humanize people. I mean, bring, uh, bring people. Up. There's so much emphasis in self and the absence of others. The other side has only one historical narrative. That's assumption that we encounter in working with Palestinian Israeli history teachers. Could you move in, please? 
so why we choose narrative? Why we didn't choose history in our work? I think history, what means to us, what part of history we narrate, we remember. And this is interpretation of history. It, it will be different according to, to, to the time that we are passing or we're going through. You know, if we are in more trustful situation, maybe we look at the, our our historical narrative, what we remember from history, what we narrate to us, us, and our children will be different rather than when we were in conflict, so high high time of conflict. And um, as we uh, everybody knows about the Palestinian history, you know, occupation, Nakba, catastrophe, etc., and to follow. Uh, also, agreement, uh, which is, uh, I'm not evaluating it's uh, good or bad or it was successful or not, but it allows for people to really approach to each other from all walks of life. That's one we started to address the issue of education. That's uh, and and that's when I started early my research on what is done in the Palestinian Israeli history. What's the content of history in both sides? And the finding is not strange. We are right. They are wrong. There is no recognition of each other geopolitical situation. Um, we always try to do the good things. They are not. Uh, we always count our victims and our victimization, the others as if the others has no victims. And also what's striking to us, the peaceful coexistence between Palestinian, Jews, Christian, and Muslim is almost not there. So focus on war and winning, etc. So as a result of the other is absence from both Palestinian school and Israeli schools. So children of both nations are growing up not knowing about each other except in the you know, in Masati uh, kind of situation. Could you pass on, please? Uh, that's one we started really com contemplating my professor colleague Dan Baron, who passed away in 2008, may God his soul. Uh, we started to say how we could change, how we can you know, you know, impose change or try to change to move uh, education and textbooks from being perpetrated conflict to be peace, peaceful oriented and we started the bottom at bottom top down is obsolete and we know it from our experiences working with Yuli Tamir the Israeli Minister of Education in the late 90s and the Palestinian Minister of Education Lemis Sami. that's no way that we expect change it from the officials so we are went to bottom up approach. Of course, bottom up approach has its own weaknesses, its own challenges, but still, you know, uh, it's still one thing that we can do, uh, uh, you know, in, in, the, in the heights and in the, uh, of the conflict and situation. Could you move on, please? So that's why we started this project, what we call it, learning each other historical narrative, which is, this is the title of the book, where Pimpex basically, we put the Israeli narrative of the 19th of the 20th century, the Palestinian narrative of the 20th century, side by side with open space in the middle, meaning that people have the right to establish their historical narrative if they allowed, of course, if, uh, you know, but also it's like moving into social psychological movement because changing uh, your narrative and trying to really uh, ad adapt to the other side narrative or even to recognize it, it's a big challenge. It has to go through stages and phases. That's why very symbolic if you look at this uh, cover of the book. And in the second page, the second slide, shows how we design uh, the middle, which is uh, this is the Israeli side narrative on the left side, on the right side is the Palestinian narrative, and uh, how this is goes throughout the book. And it, it it's itself become an empowering and trying to really, uh, I mean, neutralize that closed history, the closed text of history to be an open for discussions. And we went through the processes with school, Palestinian Israeli school teachers. It wasn't accepted by official, but still being taken by uh, certain schools and certain NGOs research. And when we finished, uh, we moved to the second uh, cover page uh, if you look at it, it is completely different than the first page. Even if you are trying to recognize the existence of the other side narrative as a way of tolerance, a humanization, developing sympathy, empathy, toward trying reconciliation, uh, still you are restricted by your own, uh, I mean, reality. That's why these two people trying to reach out as individuals, but they are uh, restricted by others other, you know, I mean, impediment or other difficulties that or challenges that facing us. So even with yes. to move in, it's not really an easy process. Could you move 
on, please. This is the Hebrew cover page, the same, move on, please. What we found out, uh, it's, it's, of course, you're visiting historical narrative, it's not an easy process, uh, in, especially in time of conflict. Uh, and there are many reasons we found it that, uh, as uh, the Nobel Prize spe you know, uh, speaker said, Rabin was accused of being traitor. So if you are uh, to enter into recognizing the existence of other side narrative, meaning you are in, you start to understand his human rights, his aspiration, dreams, history, futures. That's why in the Palestinian history, if we move to that, we need to, uh, a new, to create a new definition of who we are, who we are in relation, because most Israelis, most Palestinians define themselves in relation to others. Uh, we could be accused of less patriotic, selling out your nationality, giving in to the enemy narrative, or to be outcasted from your own community, become less loyal to an appreciation to ancestor. And this is, we have to really uh, stand, you know, I mean, uh, contemplate why it's important, because those Israeli who consider their, uh, their uh, new immigrants or the pioneer, and what they discover in, the, in that time that they committed a crisis, destroy homes, expel Palestinians, how would they relate to them? Also for the Palestinians who've been fighting for their independence or resisting the Jewish immigration or the establishment of Israel or the continuation of Intifada until now, you know, how do you look at them? Are we become less loyal to our ancestors? Also uh, re revisiting our historical narrative comes with responsibility and consequences. When I, when I admit that I destroy your homes, I expelled you or I, I took your land, uh, what will be the consequence of that? The other one, which I, may, I didn't put here, but I will add it, uh, this is a visiting historical narrative also very much, uh, I mean, uh, uh, restricted by the future which is a very amazing. If you have, if you think you have a confidence in the future and the future will be uh, more promising, more prosper, you have a space, you have to recover yourself, to build your identity, and it, it will be easy to revisit your, uh, I mean, historical analysis. Could you move on, please? Um, you know, uh, that's what we learned from these experiences. I think it's very basic. Education, teaching, and reconciliation, it's, there's clear connections. How, what is in textbooks, how it's been taught, teacher preparation, uh, and this is easy, or reviewing all curricula, uh, you know, uh, documents all over, and this is maybe uh, an area of study, how we can identify concept of reconciliation, and you know, what does it mean when you break it down. And the other thing with reality versus teaching, as much as you can teach about peace, about coexistence, about tolerance, a reality plays much sounding role than what you try to preach. And, and here, uh, referring to the continuation of Israeli occupation and you know, practices, and how much you can teach for peace for that. The other thing, which is how to really make this dissemination and genera generational engagement and preparation. It's really something that uh, take you into consideration where you can give people, children some hopes and uh, how much that hopes will be, uh, prepare them for a better future, how much you guarantee that, that comes with the sustainability of reconciliation. And if you refer to Gabby Salomon research of, you know, that done between Palestine and Israeli, that this is, uh, could be having a momentum uh, effect, not permanent one. So how to sustain that, how really to make it sustainable. At least we, we, we would like to develop in our experience a model for education reform, how to be open history and not, uh, you know, control history and also engagement of people, uh, both, I mean, winner or loser, both victims and victimizer, and also how to challenge official histories. Teacher training, evaluation, expectation from students are also important to consider if you want to do research. Touching, reaching, and connecting with the futures is only done how we prepare our children for the futures. In summary, I would say, uh, I would recommend, highly recommend uh, to focus on studies, how education in different parts of the world uh, being, you know, considered, uh, uh, have interests, 
what kind of interest, what kind of knowledge, what kind of information, what kind of practices that goes on in schools that really lead to that sort of uh, reconciliation as a, a, a preparation for the futures. Also, teacher trainer is a, a very important also to tackle about how much teachers are trained to be tolerant, open, and to diversity, respective to differences, uh, consider differences as an asset, not as uh, a threat, and how over uh, to overcome all of the prejudice of the teachers that could carry based on their ideology or their political preferences. And, um, and the last is, uh, slide, which I really thank you for listening and I will come comment and questions. And I hope I stayed within my time. I don't know. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Sami Atvan. And now we go to our next speaker. So we collect the question like yesterday in the chat, write down your questions and we will have a debate at the end of the session. Now we have Professor Dr. Young from History and International Affairs with the title Reconciliation and Historical Dialogue. I'm delighted to give you the word. I see already the screen sharing. Activated. Please, you can start. Maybe you have to unmute. The microphone is still mute. No. So, Professor Young, you have to unmute your microphone. Now I am unmuting the mic. Okay, now we can hear. Young. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, now we can hear you very well. Can you start? Yes, okay. Great. Uh, so I'm not a participant in most of such processes, but I'm an observer and a student uh, in the last five years. And I think our subjects are uh, related to each other uh, from different angles. Uh, but I would like to first uh, start with an episode more than a hundred years ago. As you can see, uh, a British historian who was uh, put in charge of editing the first Cambridge Modern History, asked his contributors to live up to the ideal, namely our history of the Waterloo conflict must be the one that satisfy French and the English, Germans and Dutch alike. Now, he was not talking exactly about reconciliation, uh, but he was aware that there was something like a national view of history that could be in conflict with each other. And his uh, remedy was to resort to this kind of scientific universal history that would give impartial truth to everyone. The second point that is interesting and relevant is that this is the beginning of what was called the cooperative history. That is historians not so much writing alone, but together with their colleagues, sometimes even across national borders. So let's fast forward uh, a century and we can see that today the importance of historical narratives in the process of peacemaking have become even more acute. For example, Eliza Barkhan, who wrote the book, The Guilt of Nations, out that writing shared narratives of past events can contribute to 
conflict resolution, or as his student, Alexander Karm pointed out, it at least can depolarize the past. And a political scientist, uh, Susan Dwyer, calls for bringing incompatible descriptions of events into narrative equilibrium. So what are the joint historians commissions? Obviously, cross-national dialogues of history uh, have a long history of its own, especially after uh, the end of World War II. But it is more recent that the so-called joint historical commissions, what I define as bilateral forum of history professionals engaged in regular dialogue over difficult past, often supported by the state. Uh, it is really the end of the Cold War that created a new wave of institutionalized dialogue. Of course, the growing importance of human rights as well as identity memory politics have contributed to such a phenomena. So let me just show you a, a very brief over uh, bird's eye view, so to speak. Uh, you can see uh, in the graph above that the new creation of uh, these then rough typology uh, divided by those initiated by the state uh, versus initiated by scholars and also those who have completed their terms while others are in continuation. I didn't include those who have broken down, which of course raise an uh, important question. So uh, what are some of the accomplishments and potential for success? Uh, for the lack of time, I'm just uh, presenting a laundry list. Uh, obviously, they do not apply to every single uh, history commissions. But uh, as we already heard from our last presentation, these uh, joint studies uh, can lead to a better understanding of the differences or the other side of the story, of the narrative. At the same time, can bring about the critical self-reflection of one's own long-held views, which had never been questioned before. Now, there are also possibility of sharing documents and expanding access to archives, but I think a key measurement is whether there was a convergence or even consensus in some areas of their history between the two sides. And in probably the gold standard cases, uh, some history commissions have produced school books uh, I think another way of looking at it is whether these uh, institutionalized dialogue over time can lead to the building of epistemic communities across borders, and more importantly, perhaps across generations. And indeed, several of the uh, history commissions in Europe have created a, a track to dialogue among younger uh, generation scholars and students. And very occasionally, uh, there is an issue with the microphone. Not just one country, but from countries in such a community. Uh, sorry for the internet connection here uh, for some reason. Um, but obviously there are uh, serious uh, criticisms as well as limitations. Uh, often the, these commissions focus on very narrow subjects of diplomatic, political, military history, uh, and often they're male dominated. Their subjects as well as their membership are quite limited. And there are also criticisms sometimes legitimate ones about the quality of their research. Uh, often there is a need for political compromise to get a report drawn up by a deadline to be released to the public, for example. And here, obviously, the government support often comes with uh, government interference, especially in countries with authoritarian uh, or nationalist regimes. 
a big question for these commissions is what impact do they have? Uh, it is often said historian or professionals can reach agreement, but what about the public? What about the politicians? And how useful are those textbooks, even if they are created? And these are often very uncertain. And finally, maybe this is a, a, a paradoxical that sometimes uh, uh, between countries, there are many alternatives of dialogue to the point that a special institution like the Joint His History Commissions may not justify it, its existence or expense. So let me just uh, conclude by that saying that the Joint History Commissions uh, embody mutual desire to engage in formal dialogue over difficult paths as equal partners. And this equality, both in appearance and in substance, is a very important precondition. At the same time, uh, historians and government can use joint history commissions to advance goals of trust building but also as a way of influence. And this opens the door to problems that one party may feel uh, underpowered or underprivileged in such a bilateral dialogue. But all in all, uh, such a process of uh, institutions, bilateral institutions across government and societies, as Lily Gardner Feldman reminds us, is part of a process of building long-term peace between former enemies, which she defines as the essence of uh, reconciliation. So all in all, uh, successive joint history commissions are not guaranteed, but they raise many issues of theory and practice of historians' uh, role in the process of reconciliation. So I would end with this uh, blog post that I've created for anyone who are interested in probing more about the current activities of uh, various uh, historians commissions uh, around the world. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for your contribute, Professor Young. Now we go to Social psychology with a contribute of Professor Dr. Ari Nadler from Tel Aviv University, the future of reconciliation studies from the point of view of social psychology. Thank you for joining the meeting, Professor Nadler. I, I want to first find the PowerPoint uh, uh, presentation that you heard to share it. Uh, it should be. No, I need to open it first, I think. If you bear with me for one second. Okay. Now I try. Here it is. Okay. So, Great. yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, I thank you, first of all, Martin and other colleagues for having invited me uh, for this brief uh, intro, brief uh, conversation reconciliation from a social psychological point of view. And I want to congratulate all of you uh, for having achieved this uh, achievement of establishing the IARS. My talk will be focused on what is reconciliation, something that I heard being discussed fairly vehemently yesterday, in yesterday's talk, and it's something that I'm concerned with. And I will talk, I'll talk about it, of course, from the point of view of social psychology. And let me begin by saying that if you went on the street and you asked people, what is reconciliation? You'll probably hear comments or responses in the following sense. It is something deep. It is something more basic and just resolving a conflict. It is different than just ending the conflict. It's something into the separates two parties and so on and so forth. So I think that reconciliation, and I, I, am, I am of the opinion that in order to make a solid base of the, the field of reconciliation studies, we need to uh, at least 
understand what the focus of this uh, of this concept is, uh, as opposed to some of the system concepts like conflict resolution, conflict settlement, and so on and so forth. So let me begin with uh, with a word about uh, the issue of uh, of reconciliation. It implies that uh, that the uh, that there's something emotionally that that creates an emotional block between two adversaries that keeps the conflict going on. Uh, and, in, and the work of reconciliation from that standpoint is the work of basically removing emotional, emotional blocks on the roads toward ending conflict. Let me share with you my thought about what is reconciliation as an outcome. And here I want to make another point, which is very important. And that is when we say reconciliation, we sometimes confuse. We, we mean reconciliation as an outcome, reconciliation as a process, or both at the same time. I want to make a distinction between reconciliation as an outcome and the process of reconciliation. And I want to begin by attempting a definition to the outcome of reconciliation. And basically, uh, let me repeat out loud, it's creating trustworthy, positive relationship between adversaries, where each of the adversaries enjoys socially, and in the adversaries interact in an equality-based social structure. So this is important because the red, the red, the words over there actually highlight three facets of, of, of an outcome of reconciliation. The first one, trust positive, positive relationship, is the relational aspect of reconciliation. The second one, positive social identity, is the identity related aspect of reconciliation. And the last one, equality based structure, is basically the social, social structural aspect of reconciliation. And if I, and I want to address myself to the uh, emotional parts of this definition of getting to a state of reconciliation. And I again uh, would define the process of reconciliation removing emotional block and conflict. This uh, distrust and, and, and conflict related threats to the participant's identity. Let me just say one word about the importance of these three dimensions of reconciliation. The first dimension, the relational dimension, tells us that conflict exists because there is lack of trust. Conflict exists because there is reciprocal prejudices of these two parties. The second part tells us positive social identity. The conflict exists and continues because of the um, wounds to the participant's identity, which I will talk about it a little bit more later which cause them to seek revenge, cause them to prove their point, and so on and so forth. And that's another aspect to the question of why conflict. And the third one is, as conflict exists because the structure works. What I want to, uh, to emphasize in proposing this definition that we're talking basically on a multifaceted concept, and my interest is in the emotional processes of reconciliation, to which I'm getting right now. I want to distinguish between two paths or two processes of reconciliation. The first one uh, we've termed in our work instrumental reconciliation. This process of reconciliation is aimed to, re to improve relations between the parties, to build a basic level of trust between them to allow them to coexist. How do you get there? very broadly by creating, by creating the opportunities for positive, cooperative, and equal status contact between the adversaries. Examples, most peace building based on the forward in building a hospital that will serve their communities together. We are talking about a positive, cooperative and equal status contact between them in which they're supposed to learn how to trust each other. 
And this will create an environment of positive, more positive relationship and a basic level of trust which will allow coexistence. The second part of uh, the process, the social emotional process, is much more complex and more interesting to my mind. And this is reducing the conflict related threats to parties' identities. I want to spend some time talking about that. For sake, of conceptual parity. At this point, I will talk about victims and perpetrators in the conflict. Making the note in parentheses that yes, in our world, we are aware any conflict parties are victims and perpetrators. And some of our research has addressed this issue, but for the time being, let me, uh, for the sake of conceptual parity, as I indicated before, talk about victims and perpetrators. What are the identity-related wounds to victims' identities? Their uh, wound, victims suffer threats to their identity as agentic, agentic social actors. A word before expanding on that. In psychology, we uh, assume that people have two basic social needs. The need to be agentic, self-controlling, powerful, efficacious, and the need to be related to others, the community need. The need to be accepted by others, understand, understood by them, and so on and so forth. Suffer genetic identity. They suffer a threat to themselves as being, uh, as being self-controlling and, and powerful. They are at the hands, quote unquote, of the perpetrator. Perpetrators suffer a threat to something completely different. Perpetrators suffer a threat to their moral image. They are in danger of being excluded from the moral community to which they belong. If they are being viewed as being morally wrong, they can be excluded from the community to which they belong, and we can spend some more time on that, but we don't have time to do that. But in basically, what I've said until now is that Victims suffer a threat to a sense of agency, and perpetrators suffer a threat to the sense of belongingness. Why is that important? How is that related to the conflict? Because victims perpetrate to do threats. They do something unilateral. Victims take revenge. Revenge is very good psychologically. It restores a sense of power. Perpetrators use all kinds of tactics of moral disengagement using Bandura's terms um, to try and exonerate themselves from being morally wrong. They would say something like, we had no choice, they are to blame, they started, and so on and so forth. Now, these two, these two unilateral paths for dealing with, with the threat to identities basically prepare the ground for the conflict to go on. Revenge and make and uh, and taking uh, taking tactics of moral disengagement, disengagement ensure the conflict to go on. Um, so, how to achieve social emotional re reconciliation? What can we do? Because we will remove the very the emotional barriers towards ending the conflict. Uh, I, what I'm talking about here is a social exchange where victims are empowered and perpetrators feel accepted and understood. It's a social exchange. I give you power, you give me acceptance in a very broad and simplistic term. A key example of this is the apology forgiveness cycle. On the, on the one side, when I apologize, I, the perpetrator, and seek forgiveness, I transform the power relations between me and the victim. The victim gains power to grant or resolve forgiveness. So the power formula of will has now changed. By being forgiven, on the other hand, the perpetrator is readmitted into the we expelled. And the basic assumption, and we have much research in different areas to support it, that once this occurs, people are more willing to reconcile. Once victims feel more agentic, perpetrators feel more accepted and understood, 
readiness for reconciliation uh, increases substantially. Um, I, I want to end with noting a key difference between these two paths towards reconciliation, the instrumental one and the social emotional one. The instrumental process, which as I said earlier, focuses on, on the cooperation at the present says, the present is important. The present is the key to a reconciled future. It all says, let bygones be bygones. Let us not talk about what happened in the past. Let us cooperate now in order to build different Social emotional processes on the other hand are based on the premise that dealing with the past of the conflict is the key to reconcile future. Again, why is this important? What's the meaning of that? In my concluding comments, I think because it relates to the idea that different kinds of reconciliation are suitable for different contexts. People in groups, groups in conflict, define the outcome of reconciliation, what the goal of reconciliation differently. One very uh, dominant distinction is between being between separation and integration. When two parties in conflict define the coveted goal, the goal of, 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 of separation between the groups, with a border between them, instrumental reconciliations are enough to create a conflict-free coexistence. Social emotional reconciliation, focusing on the past of victimhood and perpetration may do more harm than good. When the goal, on the other hand, is integration, integration under uh, the, same, uh, the same social identity, social emotional processes are needed, where both parties who need to live together within the same, uh, the same social identity need to address the past and need to address issues of revenge and issues of victimhood and issues of uh, perpetration. Just to mention, there's one very interesting study by Long and Breckin noting that truce commissions usually occur in intra societal is, 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 is integration. They occur less in intergroup or international conflicts. So, I think the major point to be remembered is, first of all, to understand what do groups mean by reconciliation? Where do they want to go? We, we do not know, they know. I think uh, another point uh, to conclude is that um, there are different emphasis on different dimensions of reconciliation in, in, dif in different contexts. And uh, I will end with the last point, which is a very good, great interest to me the relationships between levels of reconciliation. There is intrapersonal reconciliation when individuals feel good about themselves, feel that their identity is intact. There's intergroup reconciliation when different groups within society feel the same way. And how is that really group reconciliation or to inter-reconciliation? I think these are some of the questions some of the questions that uh, uh, I would put forward and some of the points for future study or contemplation uh, in the area of uh, reconciliation studies. Thank you for listening. Hope I didn't take too much time. Thank you. What happened? Hello. Hello. Yes. Hello. Hello. Yeah. Yes. We are here in uh, Liana Center, actually. Yeah, who is there? Did you hear? Yeah, we heard you very well. I think with the participants huh? are here. We all heard you. But maybe Francesco is out, I guess. I am here. Hi, Lydia. Where Francesco is on mute. We oh. I see. I see. It was mute, my microphone. Oh. Thank you, Ayad.
Yes, so I wanted to thank Professor Arinadele for his uh, talk, and now we can go to Professor Tsu from Taiwan, the difficulty and necessity of political reconciliation from transitional justice in Taiwan. Thank you. Um, okay, I'm, I'm trying to share my screen. Can you, can you see it being shared right now? So actually, I can still see a slide from Professor Nadler's presentation currently. Yeah, so let me see. Okay, now we can see yours. Okay, you can see mine. Okay, that's great. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, uh, Professor uh, 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 Hassanon for, for inviting us and uh, uh, we are truly happy to be part of this great initiative. And um, actually, I would, uh, I would like to say that um, reconciliation studies in Taiwan is still in its very early stage. And fortunately, we have a group of people who have uh, recently begun to work on a joint project on Taiwan's uh, transitional justice and historical memories. And that is very relevant. We all have reconciliation in mind, but reconciliation studies as a discipline in Taiwan is very new. So uh, I just wanna share with you uh, about how we uh, think about this issue in Taiwan's context. So um, today, Taiwan is receiving uh, the, the visit of the health secretary of the United States, uh, the highest ranking federal uh, American federal government official to visit Taiwan since the two countries broke official diplomatic ties in 1978. Today's um, diplomatic victory of Taiwan, however, accompanies the rising danger of a small country placed at the forefront of the clash between two giants, the US and China. Inevitably, Taiwan bears the brunt of China's sharp power. Whether Taiwan as a precious first Chinese democracy will survive the new cold or even hot war in the future depends to a large degree upon how Taiwan's opposing political camps will form a united front to defend our common democratic values and give our leaders sufficient degree of political trust to ma maneuver through a very troubled geopolitical water, arguably, the maneuver will have to involve a firm stand on the liberal democratic values while very cautiously, cautiously avoid, avoiding total alienation or antagonization of China by perhaps serving, uh, severing, uh, cutting off our ties culturally and historically with China. So without political reconciliation, I think this goal would be very hard to achieve. This is the necessity for political reconciliation. But there are serious difficulties. On the one hand, Taiwan's society harbors two conflicting uh, uh, paradigms of historical memories. Collective memory of the past is an essential part of national identity. However, the national identity conflict between the Chinese mainlanders and Taiwanese natives is inflammable precisely because their memories are structured by conflicting meta-narratives. One narrates a memory centering on two Sino-Japanese wars. The other remembers Taiwan as the orphan of Asia that are exploited, oppressed by neighboring powers and are victims, are colonization, including the Chinese settler state after the war. One's hero is another's villain. On the other hand, even as long-term uh, opinion polls show a steady rise of Taiwanese identity, uh, especially among young people, the type of rising Taiwan identity as shown in uh, the Sunflower Movement in 2014 uh, showcases a new national identity quite antagonistic to Chinese elements. Both the cleavage and the development of a new uh, Taiwan identity leaves our leaders very little room for cross-strait maneuvers while at the same time uh, aggravating domestic political strife. So transitional justice is one of the major battlegrounds for the political strife between warring uh, political camps. In contemporary Taiwan, 
issues involving the formation of collective historical memories, such as historical uh, textbook guidelines or historical memorials or statues are typically framed uh, under transitional justice. And many people, especially those who want to remove any trace of authoritarian legacy and cut off Chinese ties, regard instant removal as an imperative out of justice. In recent years, we see repeated instances of vandalisms from both camps of uh, uh, vandalism targeted at statues, which they consider as symbolism of oppression. The vandalism signals resentment and the vindictiveness among uh, opposing camps. Uh, from the slide, you can see uh, these instances of vandalism. Uh, since 2019, my colleagues and I have begun a project on the ethics of historical memories, and we hope we will pioneer reconciliation studies in Taiwan. Now, I just, just for the sake of time, I just offer some uh, ideas that have in the past uh, struck us as quite important. Um, first, um, geopolitical and uh, democratic development constitute important things in which the idea of, of reconciliation has to be embedded. Intricate analysis of the setting is required for us to grasp the need or even urgency of reconciliation. It means reconciliation, whether and how far we should do that, may be highly context sensitive, despite its deontological nature. Second, transitional justice and historical memory formation are not necessarily two sides of the same coin. Transitional justice in Taiwan's context necessarily centers on victims and victimizers and the negative uh, side of memory. Historical memory, in contrast, involves all the li lived experience of people on, in this land and could involve both negative and positive, positive side of history. Building historical memory should be a common dialogical enterprise rather than in initiatives monopolized by those who consider themselves victims. Third, for some people, reconciliation requires forgetting. For others, reconciliation re demands remembering. Both make sense under certain circumstances, but how to reconcile different visions of reconciliation? So I think there is a great need uh, to continue to theorize uh, the idea of reconciliation. We have also realized that reconciliation uh, as a goal or value appears quite shallow and pale in contemporary Taiwan's public discourse. Um, is there a cultural root to that? How do we find intellectual or even spiritual resources in our culture and history for the purpose of reconciliation? This is uh, a challenge that uh, all, most of us have realized that is quite important. Uh, last is that the role of history as a discipline is very tricky. Should it be oriented by substantive uh, values uh, such as reconciliation, or is it just as a Professor Yang Ping just said, uh, sh should be a scientific and objective enterprise? Um, as Ernest Renan, Renan said, progress in historical studies often constitutes a danger for nationality. Well, in con Taiwan, by contrast, the discipline of Taiwan history is inextricably bound up with the rise of nation Taiwan national na nationality. Should it continue to be so? Should, conti uh, should reconciliation be a value orienting historical studies? That is also an important question that has arisen in, uh, in our discussion. So I will conclude at this point, and uh, I hope that in the future we will um, take our project to the regional and international level and uh, con contribute uh, to reconciliation studies in general. So um, uh, I want to congratulate all of you, uh, especially the uh, initiators of this great uh, achievement of uh, IARS. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Tsu, for your contribute. Now we go to Professor, Professor Kuhn from uh, International Relations, uh, South Korea, Varieties of International Reconciliation. In the meanwhile, I say also thanks to all those that are collecting their questions and observations in the chat. 
So we, we have still three contributes now, and uh, we will find also some time to discuss the observations in the chat. But now we can start with Professor Chun. So my file are shared right now. Yes, we can see it. Okay. Uh, good evening. Next year is evening is over. So I'm very happy to meet you and share my research in interest. And thanks to Vienna University, Professor Martin, Karina, and Toyomi, of course, for organizing this wonderful international conference. Though we are not meeting in person, unfortunately. So before I begin, let me introduce myself briefly. So I am Jayeon Chan, and I'm an associate professor of the Department of International Relations, Yonsei University, Korea. So my main research interest is foreign policy in East Asia and international reconciliation after war and colonization. So, So uh, after conflict, states occasionally succeed in reconciling with former enemies. So when they do, they do so in different ways, as we can see. So some countries grudgingly sign a treaty to signal the end of a conflict. Others provide for not only reparation and compensation, but also economy assistance as material evidence of reconciliation. So is there a way to systemically organize different ways in which states reconcile? So can different types of reconciliation be identified? Can you make a kind of uh, ideal type, typology? So if so, what explains the type? So I'd like to address this research question in this presentation. Uh, considering the time limits, I will skip the literature review. So usually they are talking about the reconciliation is an ongoing process or the political process. The rebel, some scholars say about rebel and also say rebel. And this one is my previous articles about the, I categorized the reconciliation. I made those kind of stages of reconciliation. Okay, so I define international reconciliation as an international political process by which states reserve or overcome contemporary problems caused by past conflicts between them, including war and colonization. I try to include both the war and colonization, especially considering the East Asian phenomenon, we include both of them. So there are indeed different ways in which states reconcile with former enemies. And I classify them into four ideal types. This one first. The so procedural, material, ideational, and substantial. So these distinctions are based on a state's behavior toward its former enemy and former adversary and its internal and external efforts to get past their conflictual relationship. While reconciliation involves by necessity both parties to a conflict taking action, my analysis focused on the state that initiated an action that resulted in harm in the other state. So each action during the conflict during the conflict can be a legal ground on which the injured state demand reparations or compensation after the conflict is over, while at the same time, they, they may have produced resentment, mistrust, and even hatred among those who were negatively affected. So the initiating states bears a legal and more moral responsibility for remedying the injury and bad blood in order to reconcile. 
and its behaviors after the conflict are critical to shaping the type of reconciliation. So on the basis of my research and examination of post-conflict relations after World War II and colonialism and colonization, I have identified four ideal types, procedural, material, ideational, and substantial. So I hypothesize that states tend to choose one type over the others under the pressure of the combined force of national interest and national reflection. That means I um, designed two dependent, independent variables. To test the hypothesis, I conduct a structural comparative analysis of cases of reconciliation between France and Algeria, Japan and Korea, West Germany and Germany and Czechoslovakia and the Czech Republic or and West Germany and Poland. So they closely resemble the four ideal types. Okay, to operationalize these logics, I measure the levels of material interest and reflection. Okay, this one. And hypothesize that the choice on actor max is not determined by one or the other, but rather shaped by the combination of their levels. I follow the conventional understanding of material interest. A state has an interest in maximize, maximizing its wealth and securing its survival. The actions of a country to fulfill its general and steady objectives can be seen to be attempts to meet its national interest. The more contingent its economy or national security is on improving its relationship with the former adversary, the more likely it will be more for the country to take concrete measures that facilitate exchange of goods, capital, and security. The weaker the material interest in the adversary or enemy, the more perfunctory the reconciliation is likely to be. The national reflection encompass discursive acts taken by a former aggressor to recognize and acknowledge is measured through examination of official statement made by top officials and the legal system related to past hostilities. The public statement made by major leaders such as president or prime ministers to officially acknowledge and apologize for the wrongdoings of a country can serve as a measure of the level of reflection of a former aggressor. Although it is more difficult for a government to make an official apology due to differences among political and societal actors, or we can think about the societal backlash, such difficulties themselves powerfully indicate that the political apology does signal serious critical reflection. And second standard is a country's legal system. It reflects its dominant opinions and institutionalizes them with the support of state legitimacy and authority. Because of degree of social agreement and support are necessary for laws, laws to be enacted and executed, a country's reflection on its past can be assessed through the analysis of what laws have been established that related to its past affairs and how they evaluate its past. In this article, in my presentation, I assess the degree of a country's reflection in terms of the combination of the degree to which top officials recognize their country's responsibilities and the degree to which the country institutionalized its sense of responsibility in the legal system.
So the first one is the procedural reconciliation. So please remember it is, it is the ideal type. So this ideal type can be illustrated with France's relationship with Algeria. The French government formally ended the state of conflict and recognized Algeria as a sovereign independent state by signing the Avian Accord in 1962. But stopped short of acknowledging, much less apologizing for the committing during the colonization and conflict. So their relationship remains to this day a fragile share that is filled with neither substantive acts of reparation or compensation, nor discursive acts of official apologies. The second ideal type is material reconciliation. So this ideal type can be illustrated with Japan's relationship with Korea after the 1965 so normalization treaty. Not only did Japanese government normalize its relationship with South Korea by signing the treaty, but it also provided the Korean government with grants and loans. However, Japanese officials took care not to offer them as compensation but or to acknowledge either in the treaty language itself or their subsequent public discussion, Japan's responsibility for any damages done by the colonial law. These acts led to both an explosive growth of exchanges and contacts between the two nations and a sense of incomplete reconciliation in both. The third one is the ideation reconciliation. So Germany's relationship with Czech, Czech Republic comes close to ideation reconciliation. The German government has at least since the early 1970s issued a number of statements that it under the Nazi rule committed in Czechoslovakia as in elsewhere acts of violence that are morally repressive and politically unacceptable. Also, it has included an expression to the same effect in joint statement and treaties signed together with the Czech government. It has engaged the Czechs in deliberative actions that communicate the desire to make a clean break from the past wrong and develop a mutually amicable relationship. Yet it had many difficulties in taking compensatory measures. The last ideal type is substantial reconciliation. So the relationship between Germany and Poland after Second World War is one coming close to the ideal type. So the German state acknowledged and apologized for the wrong it had committed in Poland in a very public and consistent manner. manner. Also, it has compensated not only the Polish government but also individual Polish victims for its acts of violence during the war. Its words and acts with respect to Poland set the case apart from the others mentioned above. So maybe someone probably is curious why the typology, why the idea of type is needed. So the identification of different types of reconciliation allow us to see that all reconciliation are not the same. And that even if the parties to conflict make a type of reconciliation, depending on the mix of national interest and reflection, they may also move from one type to another if the mix, ex mix changes. So given that procedural reconciliation is easier to accomplish, but more susceptible to challenges than the others, and their substantial reconciliation more demanding to accomplish, and yet more durable. So I suggest that our, my framework, a kind of ideal type helps us understand how states that have made the procedural reconciliation may take additional step to consolidate it into a more sustainable form or the consolidation of reconciliation. So I envision three, maybe, or two or three possible pathways 
So states can, after they accomplish procedural reconciliation, state can move to either ideational or material reconciliation first before they attain substantial one, or the other pathway is that they may pursue both simultaneously to reach the stage of substantial reconciliation. So that's why I try to I try to make a typology on the ideation uh, ideal type. Okay, that's it. That's my the end of my presentation. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much for your presentation. Now we give the word to Bishop John Rusia Hanna from the Commission for Unity and Reconciliation of Rwanda. Title of his talk is Most Important Topics for Reconciliation Studies from Perspective of Practice. Thank you very much, Bishop John, for being with us. Thank you, Professor. I hope uh, you are able to hear my voice. We can hear you very well. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to discuss, as you just said, the important topics for reconciliation studies from the practical perspective. And uh, you allow me to use Rwanda as a case study. Any, any efforts for reconciliation must be having a purpose. And we cannot afford to just do reconciliation without uh, a sense of uh, digging down into first important point that we need where we really need to engage is to study the cause of conflict. Uh, I will possibly request for my battery to be Okay, we can continue. We need to study first and foremost before any study on reconciliation, we need to get into the background of the conflict. What caused the conflict and what is the cause of conflict? One, in the case of Rwanda, we had to study the, conf the cause of conflict right from the colonial imposition and the in the case of Rwanda, for the several resolutions of Berlin Conference in a, from 1885, uh, imposed on Rwanda the territorial removal of the Rwandan boundaries, the removal of the Rwandan leadership, the divide and the rule that made the people who were classes into tribes which actually continued to be inculcated through education into the children of, of Rwanda until it culminated into the genocide of 1994. But that was only, that's, that's part one of the cause of the conflict. In our study, we realized that we cannot blame it all on the colonial invasion of Rwanda, but uh, the first and the second Republic of Independence, they did not repair the damage, but they made it worse. So the, the, Rwandan, the Rwandan society, the Rwandese had also a responsibility, not only for the genocide, but also for the influx of refugees and the deaths and the persecution of some of the Rwandese and the, and the hatred between the South and the North. Of course, the culmination of the genocide in 94 against the Tutsis was the worst of the experienced conflict. So 
core of the, the colonial imposition, the division of the country, the taking away of the territory, the failure of the Rwandese, it was vivid and clear, truthfully, reflecting that we, the people of Rwanda, have a responsibility. And that responsibility required us to determine which type, which form of reconciliation do we need as Rwanda? And what kind of unity did we want to recover? By the way, the world doesn't know today that uh, at one time in history, Rwanda was a nation known as a kingdom which existed under the leadership of a king which had systems of governance, military, and had classes with one language, culture, and one religion before Christianity and Islam came to Africa. So how do we engage reconciliation with all this mess that we have incurred, experienced with the loss of lives, with the loss of the economy, loss of the infrastructure, loss of our human dignity, the loss of our social fabric. What do we need to do to become a nation again? We certainly needed to study the type of reconciliation we needed. And uh, any country, any society contextually needs to reflect on their own condition and their own past because we, the past make us who we are today and who we are today can dictate on what our future may hold. Therefore, we needed to be able to draw lessons from all that brokenness in order to sit down and be able to determine the nature of reconciliation. Do we need an academic reconciliation do we need to write books about the pain and then teach about it? Or, or did we need a, an organic, a transformational reconciliation that would help us together, both perpetrators and the victims and the onlookers and those who are to be repatriated from, from the refugees who had gone out to the country for over 30 and so years, to be able to put our hands together and make a nation again. So Rwanda therefore chose to have a thorough study, truthfully, transparently, make a study of what kind of reconciliation we needed. So the Rwandan reconciliation in this case is not a, a kind of a luxury, it's a it's a necessity and for a purpose. So we chose a transformational reconciliation, but also we need to study in reality the approach and the requirements for this organic reconciliation. And we had also to study the urgency of getting that reconciliation in a place. So for us, if we talk about reconciliation, we talk about the opportunity, the chance we have to use the unity as a people who still are under, under course healing our traumatic experiences who are under course to heal our real real guilty conscience for those who got involved into hacking their brothers and their sisters and their neighbors to death who still remember their actions in our case we don't advocate to for, to forget because you can't erase your memory it's only 26 years since the genocide. We still remember them. 
but we need to remember uh, as we forgive with responsibility together to build a nation and we need to ask forgiveness as we remember our actions and our failures and our mistakes and still be able to apologize and seek to rebuild our nation and our society. And uh, our social fabric require a real truth, a, re a realistic approach to making it. And uh, in this same attitude, the RPA, the army which stopped the genocide, of course, the perpetrators and their allies, both in the battlefield and otherwise, required to do it with this approach of reconciliation, not to revenge on their families or on, on, the, on, the, on, the, on those who were captured in the battlefield, but to rehabilitate them and engage them into the construction of the country. So basically, we, we, we need to be able to find issues, areas of practical reconciliation, whereby we need to encourage in love, to, we need to encourage and explain whether a perpetrator or a survivor, we both are responsible for the nation and we are in the nation under the same nation. So that required all political parties. Actually, we have things in common with those who spoke before me, whether the reconciliation is taken to be a social or a political, a national or an individual. For us, it's all. We have individuals who forgive, but a nation has to have a policy of forgiveness and a, a nation has a policy of no revenge and a policy puts up institutions to sustain our reconciliation. So I think one of the things that we need to be able to study critically as an important topic, what do we make the reconciliation of and what do we want it to be nationally, socially, and individually? Because for us, the reconciliation is the source of energy for the, for the reconstruction of the nation. We draw into our unity, our togetherness, the ability to be able to take responsibility for the development of the nation and the protection of the same. So, uh, after stopping the genocide, it took sessions of uh, political leaders to discuss what they wanted to make of the mess of Rwanda and uh, the, the outcome, one of the things, one of the few things they come up with was unity. And the unity required reconciliation. And the unity required apology and forgiveness. And the unity required patience and forbearing. And the unity required, therefore, the leadership of the nation to take part into it by doing the following. It was a necessity for that unity to reflect into the government. Therefore, the Rwanda established a government of national unity. Hence, establishing a commission of unity and reconciliation as an institution to maintain, to teach, to help, to sustain, to research on unity and reconciliation. And they have its commissioners from all walks of life in the community of Rwanda. Therefore, Rwanda created other institutions to sustain the unity of the entity, and one of them was the system of governance, justice to stop injustice, impunity, and to protect peace, and establish 
the understanding and the rights, equal rights of the citizens and opportunity for all people of Rwanda. They also created the systems of national unity National unity. Sorry, my battery is, uh, is getting down. And first and foremost, it was uh, imperative uh, of ex uh, having the, the means to put up and encourage, rehabilitate the victims of the genocide, of course, having justice which is which in, encourages what, what we call restorative justice and uh, it's why the government of rwanda encourages and works with the policies and the laws that enact and reinforces the mechanisms to heal the rwandan society and encourages peace and reconciliation in Rwanda. The last but not least, it was also a necessity to establish the responsibilities constitutionally of the Unity and Reconciliation Commission and it does, which does researches and monitors the progress of unity and encourages partners in the in these obligations and more so to be able to update the community of the requirements to grow more and more into an, that unity and heal the wounds of the past. I think within the seven minutes given me, I would want to stop at this, but uh, there will be more to share given time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Bishop John, for your contribute. Now it's time for uh, Professor Dr. Pumla Gobodo Madikizela to uh, talk future perspective for reconciliation studies from the point of view of a psychologist. Professor Dr. Pumla Gobodo Madikizela is also very close related to the FSU and I like to remind all of you she got us an honorary doctorate from our university, and we are very glad to have you as last guest of this uh, session. Thank you very much, Francesco, and um, thank you, Martin, to and, and you and your colleagues for inviting me this uh, afternoon. Um, it's a really wonderful uh, opportunity to share some of my, um, uh, to test rather, you know, some of my insights that I'm beginning to work on, on, on this uh, question of uh, how do we deal with the past. Um, as an introduction, I want to open uh, the, the, the share screen, do, it does not look like I've, I can do that. Can you can you allow me to do that, Francesca? If you can't, it's fine. But uh, uh, so now I, the function is activated, and actually there are uh, two ways. One way is that you can uh, use this function from your laptop. Oh, I got it. I got it. Yes. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. So I just want to, I'm going to try, do my best to, to watch the time, but please uh, do kind of warn me if, if I'm going uh, over, overboard. So I just want to go through for about perhaps one and a half minutes, a few slides, three slides, just to, to set the tone. Um, South Africa, as you, as you know, we had a, um, a Truth and Reconciliation Commission that was uh, considered successful um, despite some of the, the problems. So this is the room, one of the halls 
where we ha have held hearings. And this was actually the opening of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. You can see there that it's packed and most of the people, almost all of them are black with a few white uh, people who are commissioners and some reporters. And this, this was a pattern, you know, most many black people supported the Truth Commission. There was a lot of hope. I'm sharing this screen just so you have a sense of um, the excitement that accompanied. They were, of course, just contested at, the, at first, but once we started the hearings, there was a desire. People wanted to tell their stories. People wanted to be on the stage to tell their story. This is Nomonde Kalata. She gave first hearing and she's most well known for having uh, issued out a, a scream that has become a kind of iconic moment of the TRC. Uh, Archbishop Tutu called this the defining moment that set the tone and, dis and, and described the Truth Commission, what the work of the Truth Commission was going to be. Um, uh, before I move on, Nomonde uh, to this day, whenever she tells a story about what happened to her husband, I, I don't have time to go into the details of what it was, but ev even now, she, she, she breaks down, she cries, she sobs, and she's, two weeks ago, I was in conversation with her. She, is a, she has a residency with us. We work, we, we're working with her. Her daughter is doing a PhD with us. And she says, it's, all, it's like it was yesterday, the way that the, she carries the emotion it's it, as if it was yesterday. This is about 30 years ago. Actually, this year, it was 30 years when her husband was, was murdered. Um, Ms. Tim Kulu, she uh, appeared at the Truth Commission. She's carrying a lamp of hair that fell from her son, was tortured and poisoned with thallium poison. She died, she spent years after the Truth and Reconciliation Commission trying to find the truth about where her son's body is. She, she died um, uh, searching for her son and she's carrying her son's body, was eventually found uh, hidden in, in some one of the apartheid farms. But this is the, the, the hair that fell from her son's head after the Italian poison and it had still some hair, some of his hair in it. Now, this is the grandson of Ms. Simchim Kulu, and this is the question that he wanted to, he was asking, where did they put my father's bones? And this young man now is destroyed, he is into drugs, into, he's in alcohol, he has not been able to have a stable life. So these are some of the, uh, just few example, examples of who are the people who came to the commission today. And I share this just to point out that what we are dealing with in South Africa now, we are dealing with a situation where people are carrying memories. And these memories are carried not simply, you know, as something that happened in the past. They're very much part of who they are. There's a lot of anger, there's a lot of resentment. And this is exacerbated by the, um, the fact that uh, young, this generation of young people who were born after the Truth and Reconciliation Commission or who were young at the time of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, now they have an opportunity to live side by side with white people. And they come to these places like the university that was previously white or a workplace that was previously white dominated. They come knowing that they come from poverty but they, they encounter, they, they, they work with white people or study with white, young white people, and they see what it means to be poor, and they see what it means to have privilege. They knew this already, but when they are sit, sitting, spending time with children of beneficiaries of apartheid, this increases hatred and anger. And this is why, consequently, uh, we, we, we uh, had in South Africa, we had to deal with the problem of a, um, a nationwide student uh, 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 protest, which became violent. Now, with all this background, I have reviewed in my work, as some of you know, my work has been on forgiveness, on reconciliation. Given what is happening in South Africa and given what the hope of the TRC was, 
now that we are at the future that we, we were hoping to have at the, when we had the Truth and Reconciliation Commission 25 years later, we now can look back and, and reflect on whether actually this is the future that we had imagined then. And the answer is a resounding no. There are certain benefits that have been made, but certainly we have not achieved the reconciliation that was intended at, this, at the time. However, we have to li live together. So it seems to me, and this is what I'm starting to do in my work, I am uh, um, revising uh, uh, some of the concepts that I've been working with. They are still important. Those processes of encounters between victims and perpetrators are still important. But I'm asking the question whether we need new language now, given what is going on in South Africa. So the concept, the framework within which I'm asking this question, I have termed reparative humanism. It's a process that, uh, that speaks more about the process of repair rather than the process of reconciliation. And this takes into account all of these dynamics, these psychological dynamics that are underlying uh, these, uh, um, these processes of encounter after these historical uh, traumas. I don't have much time, but I do want just for the sake of brevity, if I can get two more min minutes, please. Reparative humanism, the key point here is that the responsibility for, for the possibility of change and transformation is on all sides. Often we talk about how perpetrators must apologize, they must express remorse and so on, however, here, it is necessary, as much as it is with processes of forgiveness, it's necessary that victims also bear the responsibility of keeping the space open so that perpetrators can feel a sense of being held because they can, they, they can be disintegrate. And I'm gonna come to that in a moment. Why the reparative? Why not reconciliation? I've suggested in my work that empathic repair rather than forgiveness captures more effectively the complexity of this dialogic process. Having had time to go into dialogue, but people have talked about dialogue here. Now, what happens in those processes when people actually come together? There's a wonderful Afrikaans word that, uh, that says um, uh, uh, do-nadering. Do-nadering literally means coming towards one another. It's a powerful word and it's this idea of being drawn to the other, it's empathic repair. And this captures this more powerfully, this idea of people actually coming together. The notion of the reparative also lies in the fact that the work of healing after historical trauma must necessarily be an ongoing process to repair. It's a, it's, it suggests a movement, an engagement in a constant search, constant motion and a search for the emergence of human moments that can create a sense of solidarity. And this is the key thing that the reparative is really about creating a sense of solidarity that transcend old dividing lines that promote othering. Why? Because these gestures more towards transformative moments rather than a goal. We must achieve reconciliation, we must achieve forgiveness. It's more, it's, it's, it's kind of gesturing towards these transformative moments. And this is why the word, you know, is, is important. I could say more here, the psychologically underlying uh, uh, insights around this. But what I want to end with, uh, while at the same time, uh, I am showing you, I promise it's going to be one minute, I'm so showing slides, is that the, the, the conclusion that I come to here is that what we need are the arts, is to infuse our, our processes of uh, trying to bring people together using the arts. And the reason for this is that Arts is the visual conscience of, of society. It's a way of inspiring empathy. And these are some of the examples that show how this happens. In this clip here are two uh, slides that show um, 
an audience where we showed film about this story, the story of a community of people that reached out to this perpetrator who had bombed, planted a bomb and killed uh, people in this community, black people, you know, was targeting black people. And so we uh, worked with a filmmaker to create a film to tell the story. And then we used the film to open up the conversation about this beyond the community. And this is one of the encounter moments. It was not easy, but this is one of the moments that show the, the, the kind of the embodied when people say, can I hug you? Can I, you know, can I, can I embrace you? This is when people are using their bodies as a way of saying, you know, I, I accept you. Another word, of course, is I forgive you, but it's just this justice repair process. Uh, so this was about the film. Here we worked, uh, I had a, a Mellon uh, grant and uh, the Mellon grant was defined as a grant that would um, explore these artistic forms. These are students who were activists at the University of Cape Town. They were leading uh, students, leading the protest. We worked with them with uh, one of the largest uh, theaters in, in, in Cape Town, the Baxter Theater. They created uh, um, this film, uh, uh, sorry, this, this, uh, uh, this performance, this play called The Fall. They themselves created it. They themselves were the activists. And it was a very moving uh, um, a performance. After each performance, at least in the first week, we had, a, um, we had a conversation with the audience. I facilitated the dialogue with them and the audience. And we have, as a result of that conversation, people, there were calls into the radio, there were letters to the, to the editors where people were saying, including white people, now we understand. Now we know what this was about. We did not know, we thought this was just about violence. Now we know. So there is something that possibilities opened up with the arts. And finally, this is a dress that uh, is called the blue dress. It sits at the, it's, it's, it's at the uh, uh, Constitution Hill and it's, it, it has become a site for conversations. Um, as an art piece, people come, even people from outside, uh, I don't have time to talk about it now, but it's one of those um, images that have really uh, successfully uh, uh, at least brought alive this idea of what dialogue using the arts is. And just one last thing, the problem with perpetrators that I, I do want to mention is that with these dialogues, what happens is that you are confronting perpetrators with their deeds. You are confronting them with what they did because the people whom they murdered, whose loved ones they murdered, are in front of them. Just recently, there's an article in the current at the Atlantic. It talks about how a, a, a perpetrator, just on the verge of meeting the family of someone that they had killed, as he was called in, the family came. It was a big thing for the family. At the last moment, the perpetrator said, I can't do it. I can't do it. He couldn't do it. My, my argument around this is that this is the problem of remorse. The problem of remorse is that there are limits to remorse because of the enormity of what people have done. Remember that these uh, uh, stories are not just for people who are truthfully remorseful. They are digging deep into their conscience and they are confronting themselves. Psychoanalytic theory, which I, 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 I write about in this work, explains this uh, very effectively. But the problem is that the perpetrator has sunk so low to such depths that, the, that he is in an abysmal pit in which he has fallen is in which has descended now in order to rehumanize the self he has struggled to come out of this abysmal pit and when he faces his crimes they become too much to bear uh, there are stories of perpetrators including Eugene de Kock, who had a breakdown psychiatric serious psychiatric breakdown and, and these stories and some men who were, uh, um, who were forgiven by victims, but I don't have time to go into that now. But those are just snippets uh, uh, that, uh, uh, that I wanted to share that kind of give you a sense of where my work is now. 
Sorry for going over time. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, dear Pumla, for your contribution. And thank you to all those who gave a talk today. Now we have five minutes break. So I think it's a good idea after all those very excellent topics to have a short break. And then we go into the discussion and then the foundation of the association. So as you can see, now it's 3.30. The establishment was scheduled for three quarter past three, but it's fine. So let's have a short break.
So here we are, welcome back. Now we have a quarter of hour for the debate. And I saw already in the chat that we had very interesting observations and also conversation that found already answered. I saw, for instance, many questions were raised to Ari Nadler, for instance, from Vanny Dutoit, from Tsuneo Aka to Anti, and Ari Nadler provided already also to Miriam from Miriam Rosen. This was a kind of first group. And maybe we can start indeed from Professor Ari Nadler. So you answered already in the chat, but maybe you want to make a point also here in front of everyone. I give you voice. Still mute. Yeah, oh. I, I, yeah, I'm sorry, but I can't remember the exact question and the answer. So it would be helpful if you could repeat your suggestion. Uh, yes, so here we have, for instance, uh, f the first question was from Fanny Dutoit. So your definition of reconciliation contains the word positive twice. What do you mean by the word? Yeah, okay, yeah, I know. I remember. And, and there was the there was a second part of the question. If you can read it for me, please. Yes. Is there an established technical meaning for this word within social psychology? Second, is there a pathway from instrumental to emotional reconciliation in your way? I, I think uh, I think for the question because I think it's an important one. Regarding the term positive, it's it's a summary concept, of course, because in social in psychology, when you measure positivity, you usually measure it on three dimensions: behavioral, affective, emotional, and uh, and cognitive. So positive means behavioral meaning I'm willing to be your friend. Uh, that's that's a behavioral uh, indication. Uh, affective meaning I feel good when you are around, which is an affective emotional uh, dimension. And uh, cognitive would be the positive attitude that they have about you, that I like you, that uh, you have good quality and so on and so forth. I think that the, se the second part of the question to me was very important and I want to make it clear. You know, I try to argue the tricky facet, the outcome of reconciliation, is a multifaceted concept, which is made up of three basic dimensions social structural equality, positive relationship, trustworthy relationship, and, uh, and, uh, and, help, and, and, and identity, and, uh, and healed identities. Now, these three dimensions, to me, when I in other parts that I wrote about it, are in a pyramid, are a pyramidical structure. In other words, the basis is social equality. Only on the basis of social equality, structural equality, can you begin to establish trustworthy relationship. Okay, so ideally, you would first have a basic so structural equality, and our research very clearly the tips are not trustworthy if I mistrust the other the uh, apology forgiveness cycles or whatever other name we want to call it accepting responsibility the identity related actions would backfire in our research for example if, uh, uh, if uh, Jewish participants mistrust Palestinians and they receive a message of empathy from them. Those who mistrust Palestinians will take the message of empathy, the other side's negative intentions. So it backfires. So in, in other words, to, to get back to the, to, the, to the basic point, it's pyramidical structure, equality, trust, heal the identities. And um, in different, different contexts, the, the, either of these three aspects may be needed, may, may need to be worked at, uh, or may need to be dealt with more intensely than others. But um, okay, that's, thank you. That, that was my, my talk, yeah. Thank you very much, Professor Arin Adler. 
Ne, we had the following so, so some remarks from Suneo Akaha. So I'm glad to give him the word for these remarks. Thank you very much. Um, I really appreciate all the contributions that have been made so far by all the presenters and also through the uh, chat dialogue. Um, I raised a few questions. I see myself as a perpetual student. So I'm willing to learn from every discipline, every person, every perspective, every nationality, every culture uh, as I move along. I'm, I just turned 71, a very young student. Uh, because of the limitation of time, I just want to raise three questions, if I may. One is how does one, or how does a community bringing the voiceless into reconciliation dialogue? By voiceless, I mean minorities, I mean victims, I mean minorities uh, on the victorious side. That is, an example of this is uh, Japan, China, Japan, Korea uh, relations. That is, they are, uh, there's a sense of victimhood on the part of many Japanese public members who were anti-war, anti-imperialism, anti-colonialism, anti-militarism during the times of war. A few of them have begun to speak up, but the hegemonic coalition of forces, intellectual, cultural, uh, business, and political, and so forth today are trying to prevent their voices from being heard. So how do you relate this sense of injustice done to uh, not just the uh, victims of Japan's imperialism and aggression and militarism, but also on the part of some members of the Japanese public into the mainstream of political dialogue that is necessary within Japan in order for Japan to reconcile itself with the neighboring countries or as, as part of that reconciliation. The second question I have is, uh, is there a kind of an age appropriate method uh, of uh, uh, approach to reconciliation? That is just as uh, we grow up and develop our cognitive, uh, attitudinal and affective uh, faculties at different rates, at different ages, reconciliation may require different approaches to uh, different age categories of people, be they victims, be they on the side of the majority or um, uh, the, 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 uh, the conqueror, the former colonial powers uh, uh, and so forth. The third question I want to bring up is the idea of uh, recognition versus uh, redistribution. By recognition, I mean when somebody says, I feel injustice has, injustice has been done to me, please recognize it. I feel I have been totally neglected. I have been absent from the political dialogue. Please recognize me as one of the participants in the political dialogue. Redistribution means now that I have been recognized, I demand access to a share in political power, in material resources. One that is recognition requires uh, individual level, psychological, social, psychological, social, sociological, political reconciliation. But uh, redistribution really requires uh, the commitment on the part of those who are in power to commit themselves to sharing their power sharing their resources when they are the dominant power and they don't see a necessity to do so. So how do you move from recognition to uh, redistributional reconciliation? That's it, thank you. Thank you so much. This is also a very crucial point. And here I see also that Tatsu is raising his hand, so please. Okay, um, Tatsushi Arai, Kent State University. A, I really, really appreciated each and every one of the presentations, which are of a very high quality, uh, very engaging. Thank you very much. I'm really tempted to get into questions and comments with respect to each one of those uh, fine presentations. But in the interest of 
continuously supporting the further development of the association, given that this is the first session. I wanted to just offer one question to which any panelists can choose to respond if you so wish. It appears to me that um, it is very difficult to study as a reconciliation without studying other things. And to be more precise, uh, restorative justice, transitional justice, restitution of that kind, uh, Professor uh, Chun and Professor Jimmy Su talked about are definitely within the realm of reconciliation studies, uh, conventional thought. But then, as uh, Professor uh, Adwan, uh, Nadula, Richard, Mr. Richahana, and Pamela, I think they all talk about structural dimensions and other dimensions. And that helped me think that there's always a reconciliation plus. Reconciliation plus the resolution of conflict. Reconciliation plus the transformation of conflict. Reconciliation plus the reconstruction of the nation or uh, the nation system or development in the case of Rwandan uh, case study. So I'm just casting a vote of confidence to a reconciliation studies association to study the intersection between reconciliation study proper and all those things that enable reconciliation, or in the case of South Africa, the continuous effort to decolonization that builds on the initial attempt at reconciliation. And so, I'm just uh, emphasizing the importance of Reconciliation Plus as the focus of association and, and its engagement. And the second uh, last thing quickly is that among all the many of those uh, uh, presentations, there is an underlying emphasis on conflict generating and conflict perpetuating systems that have structural cultural dimensions. So to the extent that when we can say, uh, uh, perpetrators and victims, that is not an easy situation, but that is still only a beginning. And there is, as in Israel Palestine situation, there is this whole system that forces certain agents to act one way or another. But unless and until we work on the long-term transformation of a system, it is very difficult even to begin to have an, an agency of actors to be able to apologize or receive an apology. So I think those are the two dimensions that came uh, quite prominent by doing comparison and contrast between those um, fine presentations. Thank you. So thank you very much. So there are many interesting voices in the chat and unfortunately we cannot uh, explore all of them. Uh, we are approaching also to the end of the time for the debate. I think that uh, since also Tatsu mentioned explicitly our association, we can give the word quickly to the three initiators of the association. So Professor Karina Crestelina, Professor Toyomi Azano, Professor Martin Leiner. And uh, then we go to our next moment, which is the establishment of association. So Professor Crestelina, if you want to say a word, we will appreciate. If you are not connected in this moment, then we can give the word to the colleague, Professor Toyomi Azano. Oh, thank you, Francesco, uh, for, for giving, giving me the, this opportunity. Today, uh, hearing many sessions from South Africa and Rwanda and East Asia, including Taiwan and Korea, and also social psychological approach and uh, educational approach and uh, history, history and international affairs. I feel the issue of reconciliation spread out so many cases. Uh, perhaps every participant might, might be imagining reconciliation in another way, uh, but uh, I'm sure there must be some pattern to discuss this concept of reconciliation because we are living in the same world and uh, we are supposed to belong to just one nation state. Even if the nation is still under development or still uh, being constructed after the civil war, we are supposed to belong to one, one nation. So 
nation building or what is a nation is very important. I I I I felt I have felt in that in that way. Uh, Anthony Smith or Gellner or or uh, have argued this issue so much, but uh, decolonization issue in in South Africa is also related to the to the nation building as a newborn nation as South South Africa, even though. Uh, uh, Dutch, Dutch lineated persons or uh, black peoples are uh, completely different, differently settled down there, but they must be in the same nation. And uh, also Korean issue is also related to the colonial issue because Korea had been annexated into Japanese empire and just been liberated after the Second World War. Uh, once, once separated, the problem seems to be settled. Uh, but uh, after the democratization of Korea, the problems uh, return, returned back. And now the how to memorize the past is now becoming a very severe issue between two countries. In this way, uh, if we focus upon the function of nation, how nation occupy or monopolize humans' emotions, which are linked with some universal value of human rights or democracy, and, and uh, how memory would be selected? Uh, maybe we, we can this uh, we can discuss some kind of patterns or reconciliations. But I know uh, there are many practitioners or many scholars who are interested in the failure state or conflict resolution studies or trauma studies. Uh, I, I, I want to learn a lot. I, 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 I have learned a lot through the discussions, and uh, I, I knew there are many many levels of uh, na nations in this world and the sovereign states, number of sovereign states are re very limited, just to 193. So, and uh, yeah, but we must uh, support this nation state system and the reconciliation program is, uh, is a very universal issue, but uh, it's up to the uh, stage how nations are being built in each regions and how nation to nation relations have been have been built after the empire collapsed or after the colony became in independent and after the Cold War finished. Yeah, I understand in this way. Sorry for taking time, but uh, I'm very looking forward to continue to discuss this issue more. And, uh, and the anthropological approach or social psychological approach are very, very welcomed. I, I'm a, a political historian, but uh, peace studies or conflict resolution studies or religious studies, uh, many disciplines, scholars, must work together to, to support this, this very multidisciplinary issues because emotion is a product of social structure and political structure and also culture or yeah, many approaches must, must be indispensable. And thank you so much for giving, uh, giving me this opportunity to, to, to join this establishment conference of, of years. Thank you, Martin, and thank you, Karina. Yeah, and thank you to the Center of the uh, Reconciliation Center of Vienna University particularly to the staff represented by Francesca. Uh, yeah, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Professor Azano. Thank you so much also for focusing on the transdisciplinarity, which is a core of our association. Let's try if now Professor Corestelina might add. Yeah, yeah, sorry, it was my microphone was, something was going with that. Um, I don't want to take a lot of time. Um, Tayomi already stressed very important ideas about multidisciplinarity and this idea of this particular association as Martin probably will also speak about is really build bridges between different disciplines. As we saw today in majority of presentations, there are so strong connections between structural issues, legal issues, social psychological issues, uh, addressing the past, ad addressing the nation building processes, addressing justice. So there are a lot of 
knowledge which we can bring from different disciplines. What is great about reconciliation studies is that it's not limited for, for example, international just international studies or legal studies. So this association is very, how we see it, how we envision it, is very different from many other professional association like psychology, anthropology, or sociology, or law. This is a space where each of us will feel very welcome and space for, as Lidirak words, creative imagination. What can we do together to promote reconciliation? How we can work both practitioners and scholars and how we called ours, like I called myself as many of you probably pro academics, those who do a lot of research, but also do practice. How we all come together and address different layers, different ways of um, in, in improving society on reconciliation, which is very, very complex. So as we see this uh, society progresses, we really see that it's probably will be, of course, regional uh, groups. And we also see it could be subgroups based on interests. But we, in the same time, we will definitely encourage them and we'll see how uh, our in-person conference, what session it will bring together. But in the same time, we really want to uh, not only ask people to go into their usual, very convenient, right, corners of their disciplines, but actually we really want to encourage multidisciplinary dialogue within this particular um, association. This is our vision, this is our idea, so we're really glad to see all, uh, all of you here today was uh, unfortunate Zoom uh, not to be in together. Um, but we really hope that uh, following years we will be able to come together for our conferences, for our events and build stronger association. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Corestelina. And now let's give a word to our Professor Martin Leiner. Yeah, thank you very much, everybody, for the wonderful contributions and the discussions. And my point of view is I, I would really be interested to have much more time to meet you, to discuss, to go deeper into several points we uh, mentioned today. This would be really wonderful. But the good uh, message is that will be opportunities in our cooperation in the future to meet in conferences. Now we can already share emails. I'm very excited to see that people shared email addresses and questions. So please continue. And my apologies that we have now to stop because it's already very late in East Asia. Uh, and we uh, uh, choose a limited time for our meeting. I would also like to, to thank uh, the German Foundation for Peace Research, who gave us a grant to, uh, to fund this meeting, which we could not really spend because of Corona. If not, we would have in, be able to invite you here, at least the speakers and maybe some others, and to discuss together here in Vienna with much more time and time between sessions, which is always very precious. But this might happen hopefully soon. Now some words about the foundation of the association. Um, also, this is uh, not as we wanted to do it. We wanted to found it with people in presence here in a first general assembly founding the association. But then Corona appeared and many people could not travel and are now uh, in their countries and cannot come here. So in the preparing team with Karina and Tomiomi, we decided to make it in, in several steps. And the first step will take place today, but this uh, step has to follow German rules, the German law for association, which uh, asks that a foundation of an association must be done by at least seven persons in presence. And only the people who are physically present can found this foundation, this uh, association. This might be a bit an old-fashioned law, but it is like this. 
You can imagine some Germanic tribes coming together and found something together in a kind of charismatic moment. I think this is a bit the idea behind this. But uh, we must do it like this to get the first step done. Therefore, we would like to ask your uh, acceptance for doing this here now with people who are here in Jena, most are from JCIS. A few came traveling here from Austria, for example, and we will make this first step and only take three decisions. The first decision would be to accept the statutes you have received. And so by accepting the statutes and signing the statutes, the association is uh, created. So this we will, will do. And uh, so statutes, of course, can always be changed afterwards. But now we must work on those statutes, which took a long time to see with lawyers how we must do it to get acceptance also not to pay taxes and other things and to make it according to German law. So this would be the first decision we hopefully take now after finishing the, uh, the online conference. The second thing we need to make it function would to, to elect the administrative board. So there's an administrative board in our uh, constitution which we send around, which is a president, two vice presidents, a secretary, and a treasurer. And those five positions we will now fill with people present, because it's also not possible to elect people who are not present in this first moment. So we will elect people who are here around to fill these positions uh, for the first about two months. This is our idea, and with those persons, we can uh, make further steps like uh, to get legal acceptance and to uh, start several things, uh, websites and other things, uh, membership and so on. So those, uh, this group will be elected between us, uh, but it's only for, for two months, and then we propose you to have another General Assembly, which will be on Zoom. And there we made all legal provisions that then everybody who is a member by then can vote and can be voted for as a, for a position in the as a, association. And therefore, we will make, send you also a doodle with some propositions of dates to those uh, who accept to be members and we hope to have uh, as many of you between us as possible. And then we make the votes for the advisory board and also other votes uh, we can do for the association. But now it will be probably that you find the people here around taking all the positions in the, uh, in the association, but only for two months. Maybe some might continue, but this would be the choice of the second assembly if the second assembly wants them to continue or not. And the third decision would be about a proposition for membership fees. Because uh, together with Toyomi and Karina, we uh, discussed uh, how to make membership fees. And uh, membership fees should be able also to change or to make exceptions, and therefore we did not write them into the statutes. And the proposition we will vote about would be that there are individual and institutional memberships. So institution, like an institute for reconciliation studies, uh, could be member as an institution as well, and the members of this institute could be under this institute, become member for a lower uh, uh, some to pay per year. So we, we propose to pay per year for uh, an individual person with full and unlimited work contract. So usually there are professors or people like this, uh, 50 euro per year. Uh, a person who has a limited or not a full work contract, typically assistants, for people living with grants, 30 euro per year. 
and 20 euro uh, per year for students and persons without regular or very low income. This would be our proposition for individual membership. And for institutions, we would ask the institution to pay 100 euros per year and each member of the institution would pay to get his individual membership 10 euros per year. So we sought to make it uh, quite accessible also for people who have not um, much money and uh, to be inviting also for people that it's not a burden to be a member, but uh, that people feel very much welcome to, to be with us. So this is a proposition we will make and uh, this we will vote now after this uh, Zoom. And then we will send you today or maybe also tomorrow, depending on where you are living, you will receive uh, an email with uh, the results of this uh, first assembly, plus uh, the question also uh, with the registration form, whether you want to become a member. This registration form will also be on the website we will produce. And then we will also uh, send you the doodle for the uh, second uh, general assembly on Zoom, which will take place something somehow in October or November, something like this. And with this, on the basis of this, uh, we will make the, get the legal acknowledgement of the association, meanwhile, produce a website, send around the first newsletter, and we will also start first discussion about the journal we want to create and all the other decisions we will make. And then we will have the second assembly with the elections of the advisory board, also election of the scientific board, and um, some other decisions we will take uh, when we uh, meet on, on Zoom uh, in two months. And then after this, we will have also a third general assembly when we will meet for the first conference in presence for the first or the second conference at all. We will take together, which will be in Tokyo, where uh, Toyomi Asano invited us uh, on August uh, 8th and 9th, uh, 2021. So this would be the plan. Are there any questions or concerns or things which should be said now? It seems that everything is clear. It seems that everything is clear. So my apologies that we go this way, which is not the way we wanted to do. We wanted really to vote with all of you and found together this uh, association, but uh, we must proceed like this. And uh, Bishop John, you want to ask something? I just want to thank you and I want to tell you that uh, I'm sorry I didn't send you the text of my presentation, but I'm going to send it, send it over to you. And um, hopefully we'll get to the information and, uh, and the documents as promised. It's been a joy to be with you all. Thank you. Great. Thank you also for your attending and presenting, Bishop John. And uh, so we are now already in the uh, farewell and the goodbye. So you receive all these mails. Also, the presenters receive special mails by asking whether they accept that the video recording, which was in good quality, will be published on the website of JCIS and later on the website of the association and uh, and all the information will come by, by email uh, so to you. So from my side, I'm very thankful for this two days and the discussions we had and the great people we could meet and I would uh, now uh, stop. Maybe uh, Karina and Toyomi or others want to say something to everybody from my side only. Thank you very much and all the best for you, for your work. Thank you.
thank you so much. I just want to say thank you. Thank you. I know it, you. it's so late and we will have wonderful discussions very soon in person. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. It was wonderful. Thank you so much. Are you welcome, everybody, to Tokyo? I just thank you very much. It's very interesting and invigorating. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thanks for joining the meeting. So Tokyo has 10 million inhabitants or 20 million. So if 10 people are coming. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Bye. Good luck. <laughs> so, does not. Mm -hmm. Okay. I should go. Yes. Do you need mm -hmm. my stickers? Mm -hmm. okay. I have to interrupt the registration. Mm -hmm.